Anything you want to ask is fine. Now, tonight, uh, we're going to be working on uh, finance and settlement costs or uh, uh, terms and concepts for the exam. But if you had a question about appraisal or you had a question about anything else, you're welcome to, to bring that up. If, and, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to help uh, accommodate you. And we do this every other week on, on Tuesday nights, starting at six o'clock, which we're starting right now. Uh, this is being produced and uh, also uh, comments from Mr. Dan Naylor, who s several of you can see uh, at this particular moment and uh, with the beautiful Bryce Canyon photos <laughs> behind him. And uh, Dan is the owner, director and high mucky up at the Institute of Real Estate Education, uh, which is uh, in, in, in my uh, uh, learned opinion is the very best school in the state of Utah, you know, and I've worked for essentially most of them. And it, it the, the thing that makes Dan's school so great is Dan, because he keeps apprised of all the law changes. Uh, the material is updated regularly, and he's always concerned about quality. And I'm Rick Roller. I'm will be your uh, game show host tonight and instructor. And um, and like I've been saying, any question is, is welcome. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off and we're gonna, t we're gonna look at some questions uh, which might you know, uh, bear a surprising resemblance to something you might see sometime in the future. And uh, you know, I mean, we're not, we're, we're not saying these are exact questions, but the concepts are very, very important that you need to get these concepts. So as we go through these questions, there's about 15 of them or so, um, if you have additional questions or brought up another topic you had a question about, please chime in and, and we'll try to take care of that here tonight. A lot of what we're doing tonight is all about vocabulary. And I want you to get a, get a pen and a paper. And in a moment, I'm gonna give you a link that will take you to a Quizlet program. Uh, this, is, this is something I developed. And with, Dan's, with Dan's, and, and with Dan's permission, I'm gonna give that to you tonight as our thank you gift for showing up. Um, I, uh, this is the link. Please write this down. It's bit, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash R-E-V-O-C-A-B. That's bit, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash R-E-V-O-C-A-B. And that will take you to a Quizlet program that I've got about um, almost 400 terms on there. And these are terms that you need to know. The, what, now, when you get into the program, um, there is a password. It's all in lowercase. Um, and to unlock the program so you can use it, it's Limitless Agent. L-I-M-I-T-L-E-S-S-A-G-E-N-T, -S -S -E -E all lowercase. Limitless Agent, because you guys are all going to be limitless agents, OK? Okay. And that's our gift for you tonight. Uh, and uh, I would suggest that you use the uh, flashcard part of the program. There's various games that you can play in the program if, if you'd like to. And, uh, but I think the flashcard portion of it is the very best thing to do because um, you are preparing for a recognition exam. Um, there are others where you fill in the blank and whatnot, which would be great, you know, to, for your spelling habits and that sort of thing. But that's not the kind of test you're taking and you're not gonna have to write an essay or anything like that. You're preparing for a recognition exam. So um, uh, please make use of that. And it's, it's um, what we've got. Now, Dan, uh, did they have a link where they could download the questions? Download the, uh, the questions that we're going over? Yeah. I have them. Those okay, can... all right, we're, we're gonna put those on screen. Let's go ahead and start with the very first one. And this first question talks about a subordination clause, okay? And now, uh, a subordinate is somebody that works for, you know, underneath someone else. So subordination <laughs> clause in a loan would involve which one of the following actions? Uh, would it be uh, yeah. an assignment to a new borrower? Would it be an alteration of priority? Oh, there's, there's a little... Yeah, that's interesting. Would, would it be an, an abandonment by the borrower? Or would it be abrogation? 
And the correct answer to this, of course, is the second one there. It's an alter, it, it's an alteration of priority. Uh, when, what, what happens is priority is established in real estate liens by first to record is first and right. So this lien was put on the property. It, it was a first lien. And then what happened is a, a lien came along that, uh, subsequently and that lien was put in front of it. So that lien became first and the original first lien became a second. Most commonly used on lot loans uh, when you're buying a lot from a developer and he agrees to subordinate to a construction loan that will come along later because the bank that's lending the money to build the house is not going to do that unless they're in first lien position. And sometimes developers sell their, uh, their lots that way because it, uh, it entices builders to come in and buy, you know, and not just one or two, but maybe 10 or 12 of their lots in their development and then subordinate, you know, they may pay half of the lot and then subordinate the other half. Uh, and it's, it, it just makes selling the lots a lot easier. Assignment to a new borrower, uh, that would be like an assumption or something, abandonment by the borrowers when, you know, they're, they're abandoning the loan and, you know, and, um, and, and, the term abrogate or abrogation is when you pledge real estate as collateral on a loan. So correct answer to this is uh, alteration of priority. Next question, please. Okay, if the loan to value ratio is too high, uh, the highest loan to value ratio you'll probably ever see is 100%, like in a VA loan. Uh, but if the loan to value ratio is too high, the lender uh, will want mortgage insurance to protect its interest in case of default and foreclosure sale. And in almost all cases, what is the number that triggers mortgage insurance being paid? And that would be answer C here, 81%. If you put 20% down on a conventional type loan, then they're not going to require mortgage insurance. But anything less than 20% down, they're going to want mortgage insurance. Does someone have a question? Okay. Just taking it all in. Okay. Um, so uh, mortgage insurance is, uh, is not inexpensive. Uh, they usually have some upfront money on it and then they have, it adds to the monthly payment. And, um, but that's how you can get a 5% down or a 10% down or a 19% down. Okay. Do you ever eliminate mortgage insurance after paying on the loan? Yes, so you can. Yeah, uh, it, there's a process you can go through and do that. Um, obviously, the bank is going to be reticent to let that go because what mortgage insurance does is it doesn't pay off the loan in the event someone dies or something. The only thing that a mortgage insurance policy does is it pays off the lender um, so the lender doesn't lose any money on the loan. And then the mortgage oh, okay. insurance company then takes over that loss. And it's like any other insurance. They receive premiums and they figure that most people don't default and don't go into more in mortgage uh, foreclosure. So uh, the ones that do, they make enough on the premiums that they've collected in order to make it a profitable business. Uh, but the nice thing is it allows you to get a higher than normal ratioed loan, you know, which you know, it, it kicks in after 80%. That now, makes other sense. loans, like, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Nope, okay. Okay, next question, Dan. Okay, in order to obtain underwriting approval for a, for a federal loan, FMMA, which we call Fannie Mae, with a loan-to-value ratio of 90%, what must an, an applicant have? And obviously this relates to our last question, mm -hmm. but it has the same concept worded a little differently. So do you think it's primary mortgage insurance? You ought to feel real warm and fuzzy about that one. Or is it business interruption insurance or flood insurance or homeowners insurance? Well, all these different types of insurance are for different purposes, purpose. but it's A, that's correct. It's the primary mortgage insurance. And uh, that's because why? Because they were above that 80%. Uh, okay. Business interruption insurance. Uh, you know, if you had a fire and it puts you out of business for a while, you had a retail or a restaurant or, you know, something like that, 
Business interruption insurance uh, helps cover some of your primary expenses uh, during that rebuild process. Mm -hmm. Flood insurance, if you're in a flood zone, they're probably going to require that. And uh, homeowner's insurance, of course, it covers fire and theft and all those things that your normal homeowner insurance does. Remember, the only one that benefits from mortgage insurance is the bank. <laughs> okay, it doesn't benefit a borrower at all. So it's, it's really nice if you can put uh, the requisite amount of money down in order to avoid that expense. Yes, okay. makes sense. Yeah, next question, please. Which of the following is a trigger term as stated in truth and lending pamphlet given to potential borrowers? So <laughs> truth and lending has provisions in it that says if you say some of this, then you have to say all of this. Okay, so um, uh, the correct answer here is A, payment. If you say the PI payment or the payment is this amount of dollars, then you have to give all the other terms. You have to give AP, uh, APR and you have to give the, the term of the loan and, and other required notifications, which we'll look at a little bit in just a moment. We'll look at that a little bit more in depth. Uh, APR stands for, stands for add percentage rate. Uh, that that comes from truth and lending. It it is for it is for comparison purposes when you're going out and comparing one loan to another. Is this loan better than that, or is this loan better? You know, I mean, this one's only three percent, and this one's uh, uh, two point seven five percent. Gosh, you know, and the, maybe the two point seven five percent is better. Well, maybe and maybe not. Maybe to get that two point seven, they charge you two or three discount points. And what APR does is it calculates the cost of getting the loan into the interest rate and so that you have this overall rate that you can compare one loan to another for comparison shopping. So that 3% would probably still be 3%, but the 2.75% would actually be 3.25 or something. And so it lets you compare one to another um, in comparison shopping. And it's called the annual percentage rate. So APR, here's another uh, uh, test question. APR will always be the same or higher than the face rate or nominal rate. Because like in the example I just gave you, that 3% didn't change because they had very little or no cost in order to get that loan, uh, other closing cost to get that loan, loan cost, loan fees. Sometimes called junk fees, but you know, they're. That's probably a little harsh and unfair, but APR computes all those costs in it. Uh, loan, that, that's not a trigger term and price of the property is not a, 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 a trigger term either. So the correct answer, drum roll is A, payment, okay? Oh. Next question, please. Which of the following statements is true of both truth and lending and RESPA regulations? Truth and lending and, and RESPA, the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, are, are, are federal laws that deal with uh, loans, uh, but not all loans. They, they don't deal with non-real estate loans. They deal primarily, well, they, truth and lending does because that, that's on automobiles and other things as well. But, um, RESPA is the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. It only deals with real estate. But uh, the correct answer here is they cover single to four family dwellings. So apartment buildings aren't covered by truth and lending or RESPA. And their, their thinking on that is if, if, if you've got enough money to buy a 12 plex, uh, you don't need the protection of these federal consumer protection laws. These are consumer protection laws really you know put into place to protect consumers from being ripped off and that sort of thing. Uh, when you advertise a rate for a loan, uh, look at B here, um, you can advertise APR alone. It is not a trigger term. So when you're driving down the freeway and, and you see these ads and it says, you know, uh, great time to refinance, uh, loans as low as 2.75, that's the APR. And usually it says that on the ad. Um, but uh, APR is what we use in advertising, which like I said, will always be the same or a little higher than the face rate on the mortgage. There is a booklet called the booklet settlement cost and you, uh, and you must be given that when you're applying for uh, a loan. 
uh, on a house, but um, you know, so that's probably a really good distractor, but it's not true of both RESPA and truth in lending. You know, uh, settlement costs in you is mainly um, a truth in lending re requirement. And then D, uh, they, they cover uh, uh, loans to small business. Yeah. Uh, these are protection. Okay. Okay, so um, correct answer to that one, of course, was they cover single and to four family dwellings. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it, the duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes um, are an excellent thing for uh, people to get into, particularly right now with such high rents. I mean, if you've right. got, you know, whenever I'm talking to uh, first time buyers, I ask them, I said, well, have you considered, you know, getting a fourplex? You know, because if you could get into a fourplex uh, with a reasonable down payment, for example, uh, you can use your VA eligibility on a fourplex. You can get an FHA loan on a fourplex with, you know, with, the, with a smaller down payment. But with rents being what they are now, um, you can actually uh, live for free. You know, the other three units would probably carry the whole property. Uh, not so much in a duplex, but the duplex is cool because you only have one neighbor <laughs> and it, it's hard to find a triplex. Okay. But anyway, uh, next question, please. Which of the following entities is only in the secondary mortgage market and not in both primary and secondary? Now, primary mortgage market is, is your credit union or your bank or your, your mortgage uh, broker that you go talk to about getting a loan. You just walk into their office and you sit down, you take an application. Of course, a lot of this happens online these days. Um, so that would be a bank, would be both primary and maybe even secondary. Insurance mm -hmm. companies are primarily secondary. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the small office buildings, small commercial buildings and uh, apartments are financed by regional sized insurance companies. And you know these big buildings downtown and whatnot, there's various ways those are financed, but sometimes even those multi-million dollar buildings, you know, the 30, 40 million dollar buildings are financed by insurance companies as well. And of course, private individuals, um, you know, they're usually, you know, they, they, could, um, they could be at both markets too. So note what this question says. I mean, look up at the question again, and which of the following entities is only in secondary market and not in both primary and secondary. So banks could be both, insurance companies could be both, and private individuals could actually be both. So the correct answer to this has got to be Jenny May. Jenny okay. May buys mostly uh, um, the VA and FHA type loans, uh, and they, they buy them in big bundles. And this is where mortgage brokers sell a lot of their loans to. Uh, Jenny May and Fannie Mae that we saw earlier, um, Jenny May used to be total government. It's always been government owned. Fannie Mae at one time was quasi-governmental, but after 2008 in the uh, you know, the implosion of the mortgage financing market we went through, uh, the government had to come back in and pick up total ownership of Jenny May or Fannie Mae again. So both Jenny and Fannie are, are government owned and they do primarily, uh, you know, well, of course they do VA and FHA, but, but uh, Fannie Mae uh, does a lot of conventional loans as well. And so if, if you're applying for a, a, even a jumbo loan or, or any type of conventional financing, probably going to be sold to Fannie Mae. Next question, please. Okay. Um, in a VA loan, okay. Uh, the VA lends money and the, and the lender guarantees it. B, the lender provides the money and the VA insures the loan. Okay, the lender provides the money and the VA guarantees the loan. Or D, VA provides money wholesale to the lender and the lender makes a loan. The e. VA as a benefit for protecting our nation and serving in the military um, has benefits. You know, they have health benefits, uh, veterans have health benefits and they have uh, other types of benefits. But one of the benefits they have through the VA is that the VA will actually come in and they will guarantee loans. Mm -hmm. Now, previously we had two questions about a private mortgage insurance and private mortgage insurance was needed when you had a loan that exceeded 80% loan to value ratio. 
Well, VA loans, you can get 100%. You don't have to have a down payment at all. And, um, you know, they do have a 1% fee that, you know, they collect, but that doesn't uh, alter the, 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 the loan amount. But, um, but VA guarantees where FHA insures. This is a big wake-up item. VA guarantees FHA insures. So the, the money you pay up front and the additional monies you pay on, on mortgage insurance uh, to the FHA is to pay for that insurance policy. Okay. Now, on, on Fannie Mae, when they do conventional loans, uh, the questions we had previously, that was private mortgage insurance. So you have, you have FHA mortgage insurance, you have private mortgage insurance, and then you have VA guarantees. Okay. So those are all wake up items for the exam. So VA guarantees loans. So the only answer here that works uh, because VA doesn't lend money at all is of course, See. Drum roll. the lender provides the money and the VA guarantees the loan, which means that if this loan goes into default, what the lender will do is package the whole thing up and send it to the VA and the VA sends some money to the lender so the lender doesn't lose any money. <laughs> And then the VA takes it over and they, they sell a property or do whatever they have to to recoup as much money as they can. In some so cases. Essentially, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, so essentially what you're saying is if you are military and have that VA benefit or military family or whatever, um, right. to where you get that, you don't need mortgage insurance? No. No, you have the VA guarantee yeah. if you okay. do the VA loan. Now you have to serve in the military for a specific period of time. And a few years ago, which is really cool for us in Utah, is they also extended this to people that were in the National Guard. So it used to be National Guard didn't have the VA benefits, but you know, with things going the way they have been the last 15 years or so, they call the National Guard up and put them you know, to war like anybody else. So they decided, well, National Guard should have VA benefit, full VA benefits as well. And so, so there, there are many people in Utah that actually have VA eligibility. They don't even realize they have it. You yeah, know. my stepson did research and he joined National Guard and got his VA benefit. And he is 19 and got into a house. Right, which you should have. I mean, you know, we appreciate That's the service. Pretty and, neat. You know, those people who put on a uniform and protect our company, you know, they, our country, they, they, they deserve, you know, whatever benefits that we can provide for okay. them. And the VA is, um, they're, they're, you know, the, their whole idea, their whole concept, their whole reason for being and being, you know, being an, being an organization is to help and, and work with the veterans. And so they're a little more liberal on qualifying, not entirely, but a little more liberal. Um, FHA has a lot of minimum property standards that if the property is not in the absolute best shape, you know, they want repairs made and whatnot. But um, I've had uh, VA loans go through where the property was not in the best shape. And the veteran put his foot down and said, this is the house I want. This is the house that, you know, that I've been dreaming about. And he made a big bit and then he got the VA loan. <laughs> so, you know, they're all about helping the veteran get what they want. So it, it, it's a great program and people really ought to make use of it. Now, there are some restrictions. You have to live there, but any conventional loan, any FHA loan, you have to live in the house for a period of time uh, unless you're getting a non-owner occupied loan, which will have a higher interest rate and probably a little bit higher down payment as well. But oh. uh, it's only usually about a year or so. And sometimes there's exclusions to that. If you, know, if you bought a house six months later, you're, you're getting divorced. Uh, and you have to move out, well, then you have to move out or you get transferred and you have to move to a different location for a job and whatnot. So, you know, they'll, they'll make, they'll make, you know, exceptions if they have to, but, you know, they're not in the business of letting you get a VA loan for, um, you know, a property that you intended to use as a rental and that with the notable exception <laughs> of a duplex, triplex or fourplex, of course. Okay. Right. But it's a great program. I mean, it's super. And, you know, with Hill Air Force Base being here, and we we have we have super large numbers of our citizens in the state of Utah that are in the guard or involved with the guard. We have phenomenal medical units. 
that are constantly being deployed. We have um, some of the only special forces uh, units. We have language units. I mean, you know, it, there's, there's, I will guarantee you there's thousands of, of Utah uh, residents right now that didn't realize that they could actually get a VA loan with no down payment. Yeah. Could, could be a market for you. Okay. Yes. It's good to teach your kids young. I knew some of the benefits and um, we prepared him to go to school and to work and to have that, have that two years of, you know, yeah. background and have good credit. Yeah. Establish credit right away. As yeah, all these loans require good credit, of course, but but you know that but it's 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 so important to to start uh, your kids out early, understanding credit, and they don't they don't teach it in high school, they don't teach it in college. I mean, it's it's a sad thing. It is so sad. So so it's real it's really good to do that, but it's uh, there's a real market here, uh, you know, for someone to go out. I mean, and what, whether you realize it or not, I mean, you're getting into a business, folks, that. We don't really sell real estate. You know, you, you, what do you mean you don't sell real estate? No, we really don't sell it. People already want it. More than anything, what we do is show them how to get it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, we have to find it and we have to write the contracts and, er and everything else. But it is, you know, it, is, it is unlike almost any other sales profession in that the people fundamentally want that American dream. They want, they understand that if, well, uh, you know, my 21-year-old son, I got him into a, um, a, a condo, uh, actually it was a townhouse in uh, Traverse Mountain a few years ago. After two years, he sold it and walked out of there with $80,000. Exactly. Uh, you know, that's what we it. did. We put him yeah, in a exactly. new townhome. You know, so there's the, the opportunities and, and what you're going to be involved with in a short period of time here to to impact people's life to bless lives and make money are absolutely phenomenal let's go to the next question please um, we have one question in the chat he says can you apply for a va loan more than once yes that's another misnomer about va that people don't understand you can reinstate your eligibility uh, now if you let someone assume your va it ties up a portion of your eligibility there is a possibility you may have enough remaining eligibility if you know i mean it's it's the fascinating thing and you need to you need to oh you need to have a lender that um uh, uh that understands va because um if 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 you use your eligibility once it can be reinstated and you can use it again and we have another question what about fha fha um as long as that loan was paid off, you can do FHA more than once as well. You know, so it, it's unlike VA in that there is no eligibility there other than, other than, of course, financial eligibility. But as long as that previous loan was paid off, uh, in both cases, you're, you're going to be fine. But if you let someone assume the loan, it's going to tie up some of your VA eligibility and it will tie up your ability to get another FHA loan. Most people are not assuming loans right now. I mean, we will see that again in the marketplace for many of you in your career because interest rates are at historic lows. When interest rates get back up to six, six, seven, and nine percent again, um, what will happen is these homes that have, you know, two point five, three percent loans on them. My goodness, you know that they're they're going to have an intrinsic value of that very low loan now. The people will have to, you know, pay the down payment down to get to that loan, or they'll have to get another loan and kind of blend it. Uh, but, uh, you know, there will be a situation where people will be assuming loans again. Um, and, and all loans are not assumable, um, but yet they are assumable with credit qualification. So I know that's kind of double talk, but, I, you know, I'm saying that because I want you to understand that uh, for the test, uh, you know, lean towards the non-assumable, but in the real world of real estate, you know, there are ways to, to get those loans uh, taken over by someone else in most cases. Um, and underwriting requirements change with the wind. You know, that's why on your test, they stick, you know, the, the test writers stick to very basic concepts that don't change that much, you know, because you're not going to get a real specific question on 
you know, this person has makes this much money, they have this much uh, uh, debt to income ratio, they've been on your job for, you know, three years, you know, do they qualify for a loan? You're not going to see a question like that. Because the, it, the underwriting requirements change too much. And it, you know, when I started back in this business back in, in 1977, we had four loans. <laughs> that was it. You know, now there are hundreds of different kinds of loans, or at least it seems like it, but there's at least 50. Okay, next question, please. Okay, uh, L agreed to carry a second in the sale of a home, a second meaning a second mortgage. So this is an owner carry back. It, it was for $20,000. 9% interest, 30 years, payment of 160.92 per month, $160.92 a month. However, it had a five-year call. Now, a call means that you're going to have 60 payments that you can make, and then the whole loan becomes due and payable, and this is also called a balloon, okay? So at a five-year call, when the, when the uh, buyer uh, would, would pay off the balance of $19,176, how would you describe this loan arrangement? Well, would it be fully amortized? No. A fully amortized loan is one where you can make your, you know, if it's a 15-year loan, you make those payments for the 15 years or a 20-year loan, 30-year loan. 30-year loan, 360 payments, you'd make those and it would be totally paid off. That's a fully amortized loan. A wraparound loan, this is, this is not necessarily a wrap either. A wraparound loan is like a burrito. You have, you have your original loan and then you're gonna wrap that with a nice warm flour tortilla with another loan, but it's one burrito. So what happens here is we have a first and a second mortgage. So that's not a wraparound either. A uh, discounted loan, I don't know, might be, might not be, but, 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 but that's, that's a good way to answer. It, it, it doesn't describe what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is D, a partially amortized loan. Because, why? Because it's not going to be fully paid off when the loan has to be paid off. There's that balloon or a call. Okay? If it didn't have that balloon, would it, would it have been a wraparound? It, it, it could be a wrap with a call. It could be a combo, you know, uh, that, I guess that'd be a combo burrito. But anyway, it, yeah, it, it could have been a situation where it had a call and was both of those things, but that's not what they described here in the paint in, in the, uh, because, because um, the reason why that would work is because you wrapped that original loan. And, and then that new loan that you created, which was a wrap, it had a call in it. See, the old underlying loan, um, you know, was um, probably didn't have a call. It didn't have a balloon in it, but the wrap did. In this case, the second had a call or a balloon in it, okay? Anytime you have a payment that is in excess of the normal periodic payments on a loan, uh, that, that's, that's a balloon, you know, there, so, um, and... Uh, you know, it happens a lot with owner type financing like this because a guy, he wanted to sell the house and he was willing to carry it for a period of time, but not forever. He wanted his money back at some point down the road and maybe he's getting a decent interest rate. Maybe it's the only way he could sell his house. Okay, great question. Thank you very much for that. And any other questions regarding a wrap or a balloon or, or also called a call? Okay, then let's look at the next question. He borrowed money from a bank for personal reasons. It had a fixed interest rate for a five-year term. Monthly payments were interest only. Now, sometimes interest only is also abbreviated. It's I-O, interest only. Okay, on your test, it'll be, it'll be typed out interest only. And at, and at the end, he owned or owed the, sell, the, the lender the full amount that he borrowed. What kind of loan is this? Well, it's a straight mortgage, C. It, it, it's not a purchase money mortgage because he borrowed money from the bank for personal reasons, you know, for debt consolidation, um, had a great stock tip, <laughs> you know, uh, wanted to buy some gold and silver while there's some still around, you know, what, whatever it was, it was not for real estate, you know, so it wasn't a purchase money loan. A purchase money loan is a loan that you use to purchase a property. A participation loan um, 
is, is kind of an interesting animal. A participation loan is where the lender is willing to give you, you know, a, per, a fairly decent interest rate, but they want to be a partner with you uh, on the equity increase in the loan. Probably what a lot of banks wish they had done five years ago in our valley with the uh, rapid increase in, in equity because of the, uh, you know, the appreciation of prices. So um, that would be a participation loan. I mean, you know, the bank gets part of your equity. You know, um, straight mortgage is what this is because there's no amortization. There's no reducing of the principal. You know, it's like a note loan, which is what it was, is a five-year term. And he only paid IO, he only paid interest only on the loan, and then he owes the, the entire balance. And it's not partially amortized because he didn't pay anything against the principal. We call that a straight loan, okay? See, how important is knowing these terms, folks? You know, that, that's why I gave you the Quizlet program. You, you know, you, you need to spend quality time with that program. You have to know these terms or you can't answer the questions. Oh, you can guess, probably be okay. But, you know, I mean, you only need a C minus anyway, right? You need a 70% good solid C minus. <laughs> um, come on, guys, you can do this on a multiple choice test, you know, to boot. But, uh, but you know, I don't, I'm not saying you shouldn't study. I'm saying you most, you know, definitely should study. Okay, next question, please. Okay, uh, which of the following terms is not applicable to an adjustable rate mortgage? Well, adjustable rate mortgage something changes and what is that well it's the rate the rate changes it goes up or could possibly go down but as low as they are now it's probably only go one direction and that's up okay so the, the, the which one of these doesn't apply to an adjustable rate loan and that would be uh, b discount you know uh, wait a minute, well you have what c index no we have a c it's not applicable to an adjustable rate loan that's the wrong answer dan Every adjustable rate loan. Oh, it's not applicable to an adjustable rate loan. Well, no, wait a minute. Discount. The right answer is discount. Uh, Rick's probably right. It's not my fault. I put the wrong answer up there. Okay. Well, atone for your sins. Okay. I will. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. We, we forgive you. Okay. See, margin, index, and cap is what makes up an adjustable rate loan. Every adjustable rate has a cap, which means that the rate can only go so high. I mean, it can't go an infinitum. I mean, usually they have a, like a four or five percent cap on it. So, if you were to get into adjustable rate loan, they give you a little better rate than what the current rate is right now. Let's say the current rate is three percent. They might give you, you know, two and three quarters or something to tie. But they might have a five percent cap. So the highest that could ever go would be seven and, and three quarters or something. Okay. They might have a 4% cap. They're all different, you know, whatever they think they can get away with, but that's what a cap is. Index is what determines what your rate is. And there's all kinds of indexes that they use. Um, and, but they're financial indexes, which, you know, you could chart and they're measured and they're in the public domain. You, you, you can, you know, the cost of living index, there's all, all kinds of indexes. Uh, LIBOR is, is a very popular one that they use on these, but uh, what it is, it, it, it is a, a, uh, a, 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 a publicly available index that you could go to. And then what they add on to that, let's say the index is, is uh, <coughs> excuse me, let's say the index is, is well, they're real low right now, let's say it's a half percent, okay? Uh, so the margin is what they add to the index to determine your current rate. So if, if, if the margin includes, you know, some amortization on the loan and in the profit for the bank. And so let's say their margin was three, then your rate would be added to the index. So your rate would be three and a half. And then, it, and then the cap is it, it, some of these loans adjust once a year. Some of these loans adjust, uh, every, every month. Uh, so you have to look at them. They're not real popular right now because you don't need them. I mean, the rates are so historically low. They're just, they're giveaway. They're absolute giveaway rates. Isn't that what caused the downfall of Fannie Mae? Just those adjust, those fixed, I mean, not fixed, those, um, oh, what do you? I, I wouldn't say it caused the downfall of Fannie Mae. It, it, it was definitely a downfall of a number of people that, um, you know, got, got into a house 
that they couldn't Und afford. Undigestible. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because what happened was they, they gave you an intro rate, and so the intro rate was really low. And maybe the intro rate only lasted for the first year and then took a little jump. But then the third year took another jump. And by the time they got to the third year, uh, they couldn't afford the house payment. Right. And uh, so there are a lot of people got into these thinking that, well, I'm only going to be here 24 months or I'll refinance the market gets better. And meanwhile, the market, you know, uh, didn't get better. And, you know, so, yeah, it, it hurt a lot of people. But I, that's not really the, the problem with Fannie Mae. The problem with Fannie Mae is they, and other, uh, you know, our lending markets, they gave loans to people that, that had no chance of even qualifying. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. I I just remember an a lot uncle of going through this. In loans where you just had to state, yeah, I make 200 grand a year. And, you know, they really did. Right. You know, it, it was it was a farce. And some people were getting, you know, six or seven or eight of those in order to take advantage of appreciation. The market went the other way and it just tubed them. Oh, wow. uh, greed, greed, and stupidity and fraud was 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 the main reason why we ended up on all that problem. So the answer to this question is not. It'd be the discount. Okay, let's go to the next question, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me see. R wanted to buy Q's home. Cool. But being new on the job, it, it couldn't qualify. So Q said, well, here's, here's what I do. Uh, uh, the, the Q, who was the seller, agreed that with $15,000 down, Q would carry a loan for the remainder of the purchase price amortized over 30 years at 8% interest. This is a wrap. Now, this is a wrap loan. Now, they don't give you all the information here. You are, you are assuming that Q had an existing loan on his property. And... Um, you know, so that's something you have to assume here. But but looking at the other ones here, it's not a blanket loan. You know, a, a, you know, a blanket on a cool evening like we're going to have this weekend. <laughs> good, goodbye warm weather. Anyway, we're going to have some winter weather come in this weekend. A nice warm blanket could cover more than one person. Well, a blanket loan covers more than one property. You know, so it covers like three properties or two properties or whatever. Double contracts, uh, you know, that's just, that's loan fraud and it's illegal. A discounted loan a note, yeah, that sounds like it's something, but it's, you know, and it is, but it's not in this context here. In this context here, this is an owner carried loan on a property, <laughs> existing loan on it. And, um, so, you know, and, and there are some sellers that'll do this. You know, I mean, it, we don't know what the price of this property is, but maybe $15,000 down is, is a decent down payment. You know, I mean, I mean, it is a decent down payment. It's not a decent down payment on a $500,000 house, but it could be a great down payment on a $150,000 house, you know. Wouldn't that be almost like rent to own? Rent to own, uh, there's no change in title. You know, you're a tenant. Oh, and, and your rights as a tenant are, uh, you know, not quite as um, uh, protected or uh, in, in your favor as a buyer than if you're an owner. I mean, this house was put into your name. Okay, so, okay. you know, you own it. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of different uh, people uh, that would appreciate this type of thing. Uh, you, you know, I mean, loan qualification is, 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 um, uh, easy for people that have real jobs and real credit but for people that are entrepreneurs uh, and we have a lot of them in our state um where their their whole idea and game is to write off as much as they can that's great you know you pay a lot less taxes but when you go to qualify for a loan and you bring in your tax returns then the lender looks it over and says well you're only making like you know forty five thousand dollars a year he says well really i make about 145 but I write off my car and I write off all this equipment and I depreciate this and I do that. And so, but you know, so I, I really have got a lot more money to play with. And the lender either understands that or they don't, or more often the underwriter doesn't understand it or, the, or they don't. So sometimes is, you know, and, but maybe they've only been doing this for a year or two, you know? And so, you know, there's just a lot of qualifications. It's difficult, but should that prevent them from buying a house? I mean, good grief. They could put $200,000 down if they needed to, they got plenty of money. So owner carries are another niche that you might look at getting into. There's people, right. people There's in the so many. That specialize in this. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 
There's so, so many people in an older age category that have never owned homes. And that's a market I kind of want to target and help them to see the other options there are than just traditional lending. Yeah. As I, well, as I learned. Yeah, and, and maybe owner financing would work for them. I mean, they have to have a, a you know, a real income uh, and they have to have, and you know, that's not restrictive of age, either young or old, you know, I mean, it could be older folks that, that want to buy a home and they own two or three businesses, you know, or they have money coming in. Um, and uh, but sometimes it's hard, you know, because of the way they're structured uh, in, in their finances where that money is going through LLCs or corporations or other things and it minimizes their tax. For oh. sure, and you, you really ought to do that, but, but it also, it's, it's more difficult to qualify. So o owner carry a, a applies to, you know, a lot of people like that. So, I mean, there is a real market there for, for people. And sometimes a property is difficult to sell for a lot of other reasons. And maybe owner carry is the only way you can get rid of it. So, I mean, it's, there, there are a lot, a lot of good reasons to do it. And uh, if that's something you're interested in doing, um, you know, get a hold of me after you get your license and I'll, I'll put you on a track with some people that are really involved with that. And they make, okay. they make great money doing it. I mean, you know, they, they sell, you know, a lot of high end homes uh, are sold with five, half million, $600,000 down. Wow. I mean, some of these entrepreneurs are making really super money, but, you know, the banks are uneasy because of the way they structured their finances where it doesn't, you know, it does, it, the loan committee doesn't understand it. So, mm -hmm. okay, let's do the next question, please. The seller has trouble selling your property because they have a due on sale clause in their mortgage. Well, uh, wake up item here. All mortgages have due on sale clause in, in them now. Um, and uh, they don't want to pay the balance. So they found a buyer that's willing to assume the mortgage unofficially and they draft two contracts and then they sell the property. And this guy is just, this is loan fraud. You know, in, anytime you're hiding something from a lender, it's gonna be loan fraud. I mean, uh, with almost without exception. And there are some exceptions, um, like an owner carry and a wrap, but, uh, but it's, you know, it, you have to be very, very careful. That's why you need to work with people that know what they're doing, uh, and you need to, and you need to, uh, you know, not just go to the current get rich quick seminar at the Holiday Inn and learn from you. This is how you do it, you know. And you don't tell anybody, and you do this and that. No, that's 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 how you lose your license. You know, there are there are legitimate owner carry type things that you you can do, but. Um, getting errors and emissions insurance. Errors and emissions insurance doesn't cover loan fraud. They don't cover deliberate attempts to misguide people or to cheat people. Mm -hmm. Choosing either the buyer or the seller to represent, no, that's not going to protect you either. Hide the transaction from their broker. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you knew that was not right. Advise the seller and buyer that a d double contract is illegal. Guys, we can't do this. <laughs> Could you structure where well, you can do it? Yeah, but there's you know, there's just a, you know, there's just a couple title companies in town that know what they're doing. And there's a handful of lawyers that, that are really good at this, that you ought to get involved in these types of transactions. Okay, next question, please. All righty then. Um, what is this? Where are we? I just... SO's five. SO's five. Oh, okay. This is, a, okay, here it is. Okay. Yes. Yeah, this is a... Um, a set off. Okay, S owes five hundred dollars to P for services. Okay, but P owes uh, four hundred and fifty dollars to S for some other deals that they were working on, and they decide to resolve the difference and just have S uh, pay the fifty dollar difference. Okay, look, you owe me money, I owe you money, but the difference is fifty bucks. Just give me the fifty bucks, and this is called a set off. Okay, it's not insider trading. That has to do with stocks. You know, just ask Martha Stewart. It's not a foreclosure. Um, this has nothing to do with foreclosure. I mean, it's only five things. It's just a small set off here. And it's not a lease agreement either. Okay. This is a set off. Okay. Um, you know, another good reason to work on your terms. Although set off is not one of the terms in my program, but you heard it here tonight. So you don't need it uh, in my program in the Quizlet program. What kind of insurance would, this is the next question, what kind of insurance would provide the most protection for the buyer of the property? Um, well, 
we're talking title insurance and there's, there's different types of insurance. I mean, you have uh, a plain language policies, Alta policies, standard policies and extended owner policies. Well, the extended owner policy is the one that gives you the most premium amount of insurance. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, you, you know, Alta, A-L-T-A, is, is, is a great high school here in the Valley, but that's not what we're talking about. Alta stands for the American Land Title Association. And they have kind of common language. Real estate is sold across state lines all the time. I mean, we have... Uh, many owners uh, of property here in Utah that live in California and Idaho and Arizona. Those are the three top states for out-of-town owners. But um, so they're familiar with title insurance. And if you're kind of familiar with title insurance, it's pretty much the same in all the different states. There's some peculiarities about our particular state because we do split closings and very few states, if any, do that where the buyer can close at one title company and the seller closes at a different title company. That, that doesn't happen out beyond our borders uh, that often. In fact, I think we're the only place that pretty much does that. I mean, maybe Dan has an opinion on that, but, but extended owner's policies, it, you know, that's the language we use for the, the premium insurance and that's what they're gonna use on the test. Um, so just be aware of that. This is the one that gives the most amount of protection. Uh, all of them have adequate protection or the lenders wouldn't be lending money on it. I mean, you put down your 15 grand, that's great, but the lender put up $185,000 on that contract. Yeah, do you think they're very concerned that, you know, that you're, you're the legitimate owner and whatnot? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, questions? Any other questions on that? Okay. Um, we got just, just a few more here. Um, uh, the, the, the next one, please, Dan. A, a purchase offer for a property is signed. And after the title search, it's revealed that there are two liens outstanding on the property, uh, which is true. Well, I mean, who's responsible for uh, paying off the uh, liens on, a pro on their property that they're selling? Well, obviously, it's the seller. I mean, you know, I mean, they have two liens. Well, okay, they had a first mortgage and they had a second mortgage with Key Bank or something. And well, that's not unusual. Uh, it, but it could have been other types of liens. It may have been a mechanics lien. Um, it, it may have been a situation where uh, there was an owner carry lien that had been paid off but never released. That's very common um, because people don't know how to release a loan. I mean, I uh, sold a property to a young lady named uh, Linda Nielsen, who uh, she had a nice little property on 33rd on the far east side of the valley, put it up for sale. Uh, I always order title insurance uh, commitments when I first list a property, you know, because I want to know if there's any title problems and it'll show up on the commitment. So we order a title com a commitment to the buyer to be determined. And they came out and there was a second mortgage on the property. He says, Linda, you didn't tell me about a second mortgage. You said, oh, I paid that off years ago. Oh, well, you know, then the, but it was never released. What oh, had wow. happened was the seller had written paid in full on the note and sent it back to Linda. And Linda threw it in a file somewhere. We, you know, she found it, but that's not enough uh, to get that loan released. What has to be filled out is a document called a deed of reconveyance. And so we had to track that seller down. Uh, you know, luckily we could find them, but, uh, and then they were, luckily they're still alive. And, I was going to uh, say. They, they, we sent the document out, they signed it, they sent it back, we recorded it. But all this happened within the first 10 to 15 days of me having this listing. Now, Guys, just for a practical tip, order these things early on. Most title problems can be solved, but they take time. Right now, we don't have time. Why? Mm -hmm. Just about every decent property that goes up for sale is under contract within three days, sometimes five. <laughs> if it's really bad, two weeks, okay? And so these people want to close in 30 days. What if we had to track those people down? You know, what if they yeah. were... Yeah, what if they had been d dead or deceased or something? I mean, you know, there, there's all there's ways to clean all this up, but it just takes time. So we need to be proactive. Essentially, what you're saying is we need to be proactive about taking these steps ahead yeah. of time, so we can be ready to list the property. 
Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, you want to get the listing. I mean, you only make people say yes once. You know, if they say, yes, I'll list with you, you get out the form and you fill it out. <laughs> but immediately after you get the listing, you start what all good realtors do. Re good realtors anticipate problems that could happen, but you handle them in advance so they're not a problem. You know, and right. so uh, so this was not a problem. And, you know, Linda went on to actually get a license and come back through real estate schools, one of my favorite students. And she became the, you know, the, the real estate queen in San Pete County. She had, at one time, she had over 100 listings in the Manti area. Wow. And uh, yeah, she's, she's a superstar. So I that need kind, to that kind of burn her out. So, you know, she, she put someone in charge of those listings and went to France for a month. And then she came back and decided that <laughs> you know, she got rid of all the problematic listings and uh, and went through those and started selling farm and ranch. She became the farm and ranch queen when she works in several states now. Incredible opportunity that this business can afford you. Um, you guys are about to embark on a really, really exciting journey. If, if It's going to take some work and you're going to have to get over a lot of your fears and you're going to have to become uh, proficient. But right. This is life changing. I mean, you bless lives, make money. And you can bless a lot of lives, including your own. And you can make a lot of money. I mean, good grief with the prices they have now. I mean, run the math. Average sales price in our valley is around 350 or so. That's, that's about a $9,000 commission in your pocket, pretty much. Uh, you know, eight or $9,000. I mean, 10 of those a year is $80,000. I mean, wow. Just, just think about it, you know. My first year in the business, I sold 59 properties. My second year, I sold 98. You know, I mean, with the prices, of course, I was 77 and 78 and back in those days. Um, but then back in those days, you can buy a brand new car for 4,500 bucks too. So <laughs> it's all relative. But anyway, folks, this is an exciting business. And, um, and like I said earlier, we don't really sell real estate. We just show people how to get it. It's, exactly obtain the dream uh, meet the goal so much fun and and you can go in so many different directions uh, but we we need to finish our questions okay so uh we have just three more i think right dan okay a okay uh let's see which of the following is not I don't think that's oh no he had it which of the following is not a true statement about the settlement statement Okay, not, you see, see how not is, is, is all in caps here? That's the way it's gonna be on your test. That other question we had previously where the not was kind of hidden because it wasn't all in caps. It's, it's gonna be all in caps and it's gonna be bolded. So they're not gonna to try to trick you on that, which, which is really good of them, I, I like that. But which of the following is not a true statement about settlement statements? And the, uh, uh, the correct answer is uh, C. Uh, the seller's loan payoff will be a debit to the seller and a credit to the buyer. Uh, think, okay, debits and credits, you have, you have to have a feel for this, and we've got a whole module on this in, in our program uh, to teach you, but when you get into the exam, they're going to give you a copy of some settlement sheets, and um, it's not that you have to calculate any of these things, you just have to know what kind of what they mean, and you have to know what a debit and a credit is. You know, a debit to the seller is it's going to be deducted from the proceeds of the sell to pay off the lender. But what does that have to do with the buyer? Nothing. Okay. So it is true that the settlement sheets account for all the money involved in the transaction. It is true that it will note if monies were paid up front, like the earnest money. It is true that the buyer's total closing costs appear in the back and the front of the statement. What is not true is that the seller's debts against the property have anything to do with the buyer. They just don't. I mean, that, that, that's two different sides of the transaction. Um, okay, okay. okay. Um, in our last, well, I guess, okay, on the settlement statement for property closing, on March 16th of the year, the proration of the property taxes would appear as, now, property taxes are paid in arrears in our state, okay? Uh, we're, we're coming up towards the end of the year and property taxes will, will be paid, um, you know, usually in, 
in November or maybe early December for lazy lenders. But anyway, but what happens is it comes out of most people's escrows because people have PITI payments, principal interest, taxes, and insurance. So they, they, uh, they do that. But some pro people don't have loans in their property and some people don't have loans that escrow insurance and taxes. So they usually pay those in November. Um, but what happens here is that the, this property is, is closing in March, in about the middle of the month, the 16th. So these taxes are not gonna be paid till the end of the year. Now, it wouldn't be fair for the buyer to pay the taxes for the whole year because they didn't own the property for the whole year. So what would be fair? Well, to estimate what the taxes are going to be, because we may not know exactly, but we can come real close. So we estimate what the taxes are gonna be and we charge the seller, which is a what? A debit, right? Mm -hmm. So debit the seller is right, debit the seller. Credit the seller, credit the seller. No, no, those two are wrong. We have to charge the seller. So it's either gotta be A or B, right? But we don't mm -hmm. debit one person and then debit the buyer. Well, I mean, we, we, we could in some instances, yep. but we're not gonna debit the buyer. We're gonna credit the buyer. So the correct answer to this one was we're gonna debit the seller and credit the buyer so that when the buyer pays the whole tax bill at the end of the year, he got the seller's share up front when he bought the property. Now. That's gonna be a credit on the uh, settlement statements, but both buyers are getting a loan and immediately the, uh, the buyer's lender will snarf that money and stick it in the escrow account. Because like I said, most people have loans that are PITI loans and then what happens is that the bank actually pays these. And why would the bank be so interested in making sure the taxes are paid? Because the taxes are in front of the bank. The taxes are under the dirt. The taxes are really the, the first lien on the property. The lender doesn't want anything in front of them. They wanna be the first lien holder, but they can't get around those property taxes. So they wanna make sure that there's money to pay those to protect their position on the loan. Other, otherwise, it could be sold at a tax sale at somewhere down the road if the taxes weren't paid. And that's, that's gonna cause a really bad hair day for some lender, okay? Okay. Folks, that brings us to pretty much uh, the end of our program. Do you have any other questions that have come up that you'd like to discuss for a few minutes? I just wanted to ask for the the link. It's bit dot l y forward slash r e b o c a b r e vocab. I put it. Oh, vocab. Okay. Vocab. V, v o c a b. Real estate okay. vocab, okay. Open the and then <laughs> limitless agent for password, yeah. Yep, all lowercase. Okay. Enjoy. I I I, I know it will help you if you spend some quality time with it. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, you're you're very welcome. You know, knowing there are, there are all these different terms you have to learn, especially for the test now, but even for the real estate business itself. But especially for the test, and then what happens is some of them you never hear again. Uh, but, but it's nice to know them anyway. Okay. So, Hey, and after you get into business, uh, and get some experience, uh, the best way to learn all this stuff is to become a real estate instructor. You know, Dan's always looking for good quality people. So, you know, put in a couple of years or so, and, uh, uh maybe even get a broker's license after your third year. In there business. you go. And then, and then come back and teach this stuff because by teaching it over and over and over again, I started teaching these classes in 1980 because I was asked a question by a, one of my clients and I knew it was something I learned in school, but I couldn't remember the answer. And so I think, well, that's stupid. I should know this stuff. So I started teaching classes. And, uh, you know, so, you know, Dan and I can sit down and have these fabulous conversations that nobody else understands. <laughs> because we're using all these real estate terms. Okay. Anyway, folks, we appreciate you coming to the school. We do hold these. We record these. Uh, there are a number of these that you can actually watch uh, as, as you prepare for your test. You're at the right school, and you're going you're gonna to learn um, this stuff, and you're going to pass that exam. If we can awesome. ever give any help, don't, don't hesitate to call. And my personal secret cell phone number is 801-556- 8,000. That's 801-556-8000. Operators are standing by. 
you know, and, and I, I, I give that to you. you. Dan, just put it on the screen because I don't, I don't want you studying something and getting confused and then spending 45 minutes trying to figure it out. Just pick up the stupid phone and call me. Do not text. Call me. We will spend a quality three minutes on the phone and you'll understand the concept. That's much more efficient. It is yep. entirely inappropriate, however, to call me during the exam itself. That would be uh, not a good thing. Probably could be the most helpful, but they're going to take your phone away. <laughs> hey, how many questions are in the test? Do you know? Uh, there's 80 questions on the national and 40 on the state. And uh, you have to get a C minus. You have to, you have to, you have to pass each section independently of the other. So you could pass the state and flunk the national, or flunk the national, and well, I just illustrated that, or 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 vice versa. Um, you have to pass both with that good solid C minus. Come on, for most of you guys, when's the last time you got a C on anything? And if you did, well, that was in the past. Now you need to really buckle down and, and learn this stuff because it is the key that's gonna unlock a fabulous career for you. It, it's... I'm so excited. All right, right. I'm pretty excited too, actually. Thanks. Well, I, I'm glad you're excited because uh, um, it, it's life-changing and, and uh, to help people get into properties and um, you know, a dream that they've had for many, many years and, and, the, and, and to see them enjoy them and their families enjoy them and, your quality of life really goes up if you own your own property, folks. You know, and uh, we, what, what we do is important. It's important for the economy. It's important for your buyers and sellers, and it's very important for, for your family as well. So thanks for being here, folks. And if we can uh, help you, give us a call. Don't be strangers. Appreciate Will you. Do. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for being here. We'll catch you in two weeks. Okay, thank you, thank you guys. Bye. Bye.